Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back Amy Baxter. She's an emergency physician. She's the CEO of Pain Care Labs. Today's Kevin MD article is titled The Preference for Insurance Coverage of Opioids Over Non-Pharmaceutical Options Explained. Amy, welcome back to the show. Always good to be here. Thanks for having me. So go to kevinmd.com slash podcast. You can search for Amy's past episodes and hear her story. But today, let's get straight into this Kevin MD article, The Preference for Insurance Coverage of Opioids Over Non-Pharmaceutical Options Explained. Tell us how this article came together. Well... I've been interested in why we have gone toward opioids and really pharma so convincingly in this country. You know, other countries, when we go to visit our friends in Czech Republic or the UK, they laugh at how many pills we bring with us. And I don't know about you. Do you take many pills? I take some pills. Yeah. Less than uh, five. Less than five. Yeah, yeah. I find I find that a lot of physicians are often kind of more reluctant to take medications, even even over the counter. So I I started trying to figure out, well, what exactly is it that makes us not want to travel without our Claritin and maybe an albuterol inhaler and maybe a couple other, you know, some ibuprofen for sure and Tylenol just in case that doesn't cut it. And then they're laughing at us for having that plus yeah. uh, leukotriene inhibitor. So, but looking back at the reason why we are so suborned by pharma in many ways, and I had a couple different theories how it related to the opioid crisis, one being that we were trained on statistics using pharma, trained on derm using pharma, trained on most everything because pharma can afford the best statisticians, the best writers, the best research. And so in medical school, you're trying to learn off of really quality pieces. And so that's where we learn my other theory was that we take multiple choice tests to get into med school. Yeah. So we're really used to having one right answer and, and believing that there's one. But when it came to opioids, I felt that the Sackler Purdue Pharma lectures made us not just think that for a while opioids weren't addictive, but also it really left us with this lingering belief that we could solve the problem of pain with a pill. Yeah. And that premise was part of why I wrote this article. So you wrote that insurance coverage of opioids are preferred over non-pharmaceutical options. So tell us a little bit of context about why that is and how prevalent that is. Yeah. So this is really interesting. The, the deeper in now, you know, the conflict of interest is, is well declared. I started using mechanical stimulation for pain blocking in 2006. So I make devices that block pain. And... And as I have tried to get these available and inexpensive and covered by Medicaid and Medicare, I've learned a couple interesting things. So the first thing is, um, and this is in Dope Sick and lots of other books about the opioid crisis, but we don't pay for non-pill solutions. So it's $2 a pill for a Percocet or an Oxycontin, and it's even to get a, a heat pack is going to be 15 bucks at CVS or more. So hot, cold, getting massage, being able to have access to swim, I mean, a lot, or a yoga class, all of those things are much more expensive than having a pill. And this is where it comes from. So Medicaid and Medicare are funded from an 1882 statute where they are given the responsibility of taking care of seniors who have illness, or injury, or bodily malformation. So the illness part has really predisposed what is covered toward pharmaceuticals. And the injury part has really predisposed orthopedics and orthopedic surgeons to get paid. Mm -hmm. The problem is that there's not a balancing or a cap. So two interesting things that have happened recently. One is, and this wasn't recent, but it, it really shows where we are. So my uncle uh, during COVID had a, a burst um, blood vessel and it turned out he had a, a tumor that had been eating from his kidney into his lungs. So my aunt who is from Russia goes with him to the emergency room, his lungs are full of blood, they admit him to the ICU and he stabilizes after a couple of days. And so they send her to pick him up that day with prescriptions. So what do you think? he gets. So 
he also had some atrial fib while he was in. So they give her a prescription for Eliquis. I know the bleed, but whatever. Eliquis and uh, a combination inhaler. Sure. And and so she's originally Russian. Their their insurance has run out. She's being dumped with him to take him home that day. And she has a prescription. She goes to the pharmacy and it's almost $1,000. And so, and then she goes to another pharmacy and then she calls me and she has no idea. She's like, you know, Eloquest. So, so I talked to her, her doctor, I find some samples for her, but the bottom line is that this happened again about a week before his death. And so she spent a thousand dollars of money that they didn't have in their bank account for medications that could have been $5 warfarin and a $20 albuterol. So this is sort of elemental underpinning the issues of not taking care of pain properly in our country, because the amount of money that Medicaid and Medicare get to spend is fixed, but 17 billion of what is spent in the Medicare budget is spent on Eliquis, one drug. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's no way to, to allocate one pot of money for another. And the other thing is with this, this focus on bodily malformation. So part of that statute, the CMS clings onto is says they don't pay for comfort items, yet they have a lot of right now opioid preventing indications to take care of pain, but they're really still looking for more pill solutions. And there's not a good mechanism, first of all, to distinguish what is comfort versus pain. And second of all, they're strapped. And if there's no way to move money from medications and if physicians and patients can be advertised to and pick whatever yeah. medication they want, then, you know, or, or at least ask for, ask your doctor about the one that really costs a lot. I, I think that those are where the threads are of the problem. So now for those who aren't familiar with how Medicare decides what is covered and what is not, just give us a 30 second primer of that decision making process. Sure. So when medications are approved by the FDA, the Medicare and Medicaid will will almost always look at the FDA's Center for, for Drugs recommendations and take it, and then they will cover it. And when Medicare and Medicaid cover a medication, then insurance companies usually fall in line. With a medical device, the FDA can approve it, can say that it is indicated for treating something, but Medicare rarely covers it. And so the process, so there's something called, uh, you know, there's a couple of different categories of Medicare. There's DME, durable medical equipment. There are CPT codes, which is you can buy this for your practice and then bill using this, this tray for laceration repair. Yeah. So they're different categories. And what happens with the DME, there's four different regions in the U.S., and so when you apply with a medical device to have it be considered a durable medical equipment, most of the things that are covered, splints and beds, those are to deal with the bodily malformations. If you have a novel device or novel technology, then there's no, if there's no code under which they can put this, it's called a Hicks Picks code. If there's no way that somebody can put on in a Pixis or put on a billing, you know, this is the, the device that I prescribed with this code, no code, there's no possible way for this to be used in practice. It used to be you could use a miscellaneous code and that was fine because people could still use that code. But now because it takes so much time and overriding a computer system means about an hour of labor, no one will use uh, the miscellaneous codes anymore. So what happens then is the DME group says, well, we're not going to cover you because it's either, it's, it, it's not durable, it's not used at home, it's not primarily used for a medical reason, or in the case of pain devices, they say this isn't for pain, it's for comfort. And okay. we don't cover comfort items. So it's very Byzantine, but... But at least when it comes to the opioid crisis, there are an awful lot of, of combinations of comforting items that can be used instead of opioids and will reduce the use. There are also novel technologies that reduce pain, but so long as CMS can call it a comfort item, it, it will never get to patients who can't afford it. 
So from the patient standpoint, it is significantly cheaper for them to fill a Percocet prescription or oxycodone prescription than it is to get some type of non-medication-based device to help with their pain. That's right. Absolutely. Well summarized, my friend. Yes. So what would be some FDA approved devices for pain that would make sense for Medicare to cover? Well, I always feel awkward at this point because certainly what would be great is some body pillows after say shoulder surgery. One of the biggest issues after any kind of shoulder surgery is sleep and sleep is medicine. Being able to get deep restorative sleep decreases irritability, increases uh, pain management. So there are specific kinds of shaped pillows that will hold the body so that people can sleep better. Uh, those aren't covered. There are the devices that we have been making for years. So they use a certain kind of mechanical stimulation to interrupt the pain signal and also increase blood flow. One of the things that, that CMS actually said this time was that they considered mechanical stimulation to be distraction. So what was interesting was, so I went back in the literature and it turns out when we started with this idea of gate control, the idea that touch nerves can override pain nerves that was in a publication in 1965 by Melzack and Wall. But the interesting thing is that spinal gating actually started in 1960 with a paper by Wall that was called Itch, Pain, and Vibration. And so when you go into the literature, it all really got explained by some amazingly fastidious work by a guy named Mike Salter. So what Mike Salter did was he took cats and he they cut the spinal cord at L1 so there was no descending inhibition. Then they put in probes neuron specific at L5. So they you know actually went in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and they they looked at what made each of the nerves fire. So the the nociceptive the pain nerves, they looked at what made them fire and then they also looked at what inhibited them. So in the dorsal horn and this is all med school stuff that I forgot, but in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord it's like this, this magician's room of, of input soup. And so 95% of the neurons there are deciding what gets to go to the postsynaptic nerve. So what gets to go up to the brain in the dorsal column or what goes across the spine and then goes up the spinal thalamic, so thalamic column. I know I'm in the weeds, let me get out of it. Bottom line is that, that this guy with uh, 57 cats what he found was that vibration and proprioception, so the Pacinian nerves that figure out where we are in space, that was what released adenosine and stopped the pain transmission. And all of the other touch nerves don't actually even make it into the spine. So one thing from this is, okay, the reason spinal cord stimulators don't work is that they are put on top of this, this dorsal column of the other touch signals that are going up to the brain, but it's after the pain's already left. So you've already had your, your neuromodulation magic in this dorsal horn chamber and pain's gone one way and all the other sensations go up. So hitting those postsynaptic nerves isn't going to help much. But the other thing is that all of these cats were anesthetized. So they could see when the pain firing flatlined and stopped. And so we know that there's specific frequencies of vibration, orientations, amplitudes that make that pain signal stop that have nothing to do with whether or not the cat is paying attention. Now, is this a Medicare specific thing? Are there private insurers that cover medical devices for pain that Medicare won't, or does private insurers just follow the lead of Medicare? Private insurers sometimes will change decisions on things, but in general, they follow the lead of Medicare. Now, particularly for things like spinal cord stimulators, as the research is coming out that they're no better than placebo from an opioid use standpoint in clinical trials that were published in 2023, a Cochrane review that didn't find that there was substantial clinical benefit. Um, because of that, a number of the insurers are now declaring spinal cord stimulators to be experimental treatment. So they're backing off, but being covered by Medicaid is in general a necessary condition. It is not always sufficient. And this applies to non-opioid pills as well, or therapies, things like acupuncture, CBD oil, none of those alternative treatments are covered by most insurers and Medicare. Is that correct? 
No, well, actually, acupuncture is. Um, yeah. So, and what is really interesting to me is that it is different in different areas of the country. So, for example, um, a, a doula or a midwife may be covered in some areas, but not others. Acupuncture has really good sham controlled clinical trials. Now, not every, and that's one where local coverage, for example, I do not know if it is covered in the Southeast, but it is widely accepted and covered in California and in the West. Some of it's because they've got a better density of practitioners who are trained and licensed to do it, but it it certainly is covered. Chiropractors are covered many places. So there are other kinds of services that are covered, but those would be considered under the CPT codes okay. and they would not be considered under the the codes that allow people to actually have efficacy and agency and decide themselves. Well, you know, I want ice packs and I want to, I want to have a massage and I want this and that, you know, making your own plan. It's like, an, it's like making an Ikea product, right? Yeah. So if you put it together yourself, you like it better. And with pain plans, it's the same thing. People need the agency to be able to put it together themselves. But if you can't afford any of the kit components, it's hard to make people feel empowered over pain. Now, if Medicare covered some of these medical devices that you're talking about, do you think that would make an appreciable difference in the opioid crisis that we're facing? So indirectly, Kevin, I mean, this is what I think the issue is that physicians are are slowly either by their hospital rules or because of reading the newspapers, they're not prescribing as many opioids as they used to. And the problem is that we are, we went into medicine to help people. And many of the surgeons I've talked to feel very distressed at not having something to offer their patients. So there are a couple ways that this will help the opioid crisis. The number one is that most of the new opioid use disorder comes from pills recently prescribed and left over. So the people who misuse opioids for the first time, 80% of them are grabbing it from somebody's medicine cabinet. So this means that if we can give surgeons comfort that their patients won't have pain, then they will write for fewer opioids and there's less likelihood of them being in the medicine cabinets. So it's almost a one-to-one -one with the excess opioids prescribed for surgeries and the new opioid use disorder cases. In terms of pills, those almost exactly balance each other every year. So by shutting off the faucet of new unused pills, we will definitely impact the opioid crisis and will make people less comfortable looking at a pill and thinking, I'll give it a try in high school when it actually could be laced with fentanyl. So the less familiar, the less normal it is to take an opioid for any reason, that will help the crisis. And in order to do that, we need to give prescribers a host of other options that their patients can use that can mitigate pain. So it's a long process. We're talking to Amy Baxter. She's an emergency physician. She's also the CEO of Pain Care Labs. Today's Kevin MD article is titled The Preference for Insurance Coverage of Opioids Over Non-Pharmaceutical Options Explained. Amy, let's end off with some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. The most encouraging thing is that there are so many hospitals that are finding ways to offer options. And these, these ERAS, enhanced recovery after surgery, are also gradually moving away from just advocating gabapentin or over-the-counter medications to really being more comprehensive and going back to the biopsychosocial model for pain management, even after surgery, which is the one that we know is very effective and works. Amy, thanks again for coming back on the show and sharing your time and insight. Thank you, as always, for having me, and I appreciate what you do.